بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا ابا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله in light of the month of Ramadan in light of the month of mercy in which we fast in the topic for tonight, inshallah, I'd like to look at is the concept of food in Islamic theology, in Islamic jurisprudence, and the effect that food has on the human body. And inshallah, the topic for tonight will be on three different levels. The first level is to look at the importance of fasting, what the Imams say. That's why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed fasting. And then we'd like to look at on a general level, how food may affect the human body, how food in our ahadith affects the human body, how scientifically it affects the human body. And the second point, inshallah, we'd like to look at the effect in a more expandable version, in which we'd like to look at particular foods and its particular effect on the human body, and we'd like to look at, on the reverse angle, haram foods, and what does haram food have as an effect on the human body. And then the last and final point, insha'Allah, we'd like to look at a specific type of nutrition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Holy Quran in which we tend to overlook. However, it may affect us and would be the most important in reference to the month of Ramadan. So insha'Allah, in order that we start this topic for tonight, please help me in reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. First and foremost, Imam Zain al-Abideen in the book, Treaties of Rights, which is known as Risalat al-Hukuq, the eighth right that Imam Zain al-Abideen refers to is the right of the stomach, in which he puts a significant aspect and an importance to something that we may overlook, which is the stomach, instilling that it does have an effect or a direct effect on the human body. Now, in the Treaties of Rights, the eighth right, the right of the stomach, Imam Zain al-Abideen refers, and he says to us all, that make sure you do not let your stomach become a container for unlawful meats, unlawful, or anything unlawful that you may consume. Do not let it be a container for anything that is unlawful. And furthermore, he gives us a medical advice. He says, make sure you do not eat or overeat until you are full, then that's it. If you overeat, it's problematic. So Imam Zain al-Abidin refers to these two m main points in this particular right. Risalat al-Hukuq, he makes sure that this is important. Now, we'd like to look at what importance does this have throughout the lecture, inshallah. As we know, food holds a very important aspect in our daily lives. We can't overlook that. Where we find that the food, as the narration goes, or as the saying goes, you are what you eat, when we look at food, we see that the type of food we eat or the proportions that we eat directly affects us, whether it be weight management, the diets that we have, whether it be a bodybuilding diet, whether it be a fat losing diet. It's always an aspect of balance, what to eat in reference with what not to eat, the timings of food. Even in the hadith that we have, as an example, which we, it may directly affect a janine or, or a baby, we find in a hadith, before a person is to bring up a child, or before a person thinks about getting a child, the hadith states you have to eat, for example, pomegranate. It will make the baby beautiful. Something called quince. Imam, Imam Sajjad is narrated to look at a particular boy and say what? And say 100% that his father ate quince before he brought him to this world. Giving us the idea that what? Food has a direct impact and an indirect impact with the upbringing of a child, and it has a direct impact on what you can become. 
As we see that, for example, if someone is pregnant, what you eat directly affects the baby. When a uh, hadith, what does it say? If you recite, as an example, if you recite Surah Yusuf on a bunch of apples and, and the female eats it, it makes the baby what? Beautiful. And there are many more narrations in which what to eat during fasting, what to eat during the month of Ramadan, what to eat in separate occasions, what not to eat, or what to refrain from. Therefore, we find that there's a, an aspect in which we do not look at in the depth that we should. Now, that's the first point. We analyze that, yes, there is an importance of food. Now, let's look at it on the next level. If taking into aspect the importance of food, what is the effect of good food? What does the Imam tell us to eat? What to refrain from? And what is the effect of haram food? Now, the first and foremost, I said that. The first and foremost, we'd like to look at what the Ahlul Bayt say. And the tradition of the Prophet وسلم, it states that make sure you do not overeat. Why? The Prophet says, when you overeat, you kill or you make your heart die. How? If you overeat, you make your heart die. What reference does it have? He says the reference is like that of crops or plants. He says if a plant is overwatered, the plant dies. He says therefore the human when he overeats, the heart of the human dies. He says make sure you do not overeat. Even when Imam Rada had a debate with one of the medical people at the time or the people that were in charge of medicine at the time, he says, what does your religion say about medicine? And he, he says two things in which the person says, you've said everything about medicine altogether. He says, do not overeat and do not eat until you're hungry. That's the only thing that the Imam Rada refers to. And the doctor at the time or the medical field, he says what? He says, you've just mentioned all of medicine altogether. That's the cause of all illnesses. And subhanAllah, the Imam is put in such a, a normal aspect, a very significant aspect. When we look at what the Imams say of what foods affect us and how they affect us, the Imams give us, when you eat meat or an overemphasis of meat allows your heart to harden. You become very, very hard-hearted or very solid. You find anger will start to emerge in you. You'll find you very hot-tempered if you increase the meat intake in your diet. Whereas on the reverse side, if you do not have any meat, if you have a vegetarian diet, you'll find that person becomes very vulnerable, very emotional, very, how do we say, touchy when it comes to anything. He feels it straight away. And that's the reverse angle. That's why our diets have to be balanced. That's why in our hadith you have to eat some type of meat within the week. Because the imams try to instill us that, yes, there has to be a balance in your life. Now, and subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want to have more aspect of how Allah has given us on this earth, the references that we want to look at. Look at this beautiful tradition. He says, look at the food that you eat. He says, the food that you eat directly influences the body parts in which it affects. How? He says, I'll give you an example and a set, a set of examples to make you ponder over. He says, take an example of the carrot, for example. The carrot we know, what does the carrot in stool, what, does it, what is the carrot good for on the human body? The eyes. When we find the carrot, we look at the carrot. When you dissect the carrot, what do we see? We see a circle, and in it, a darker circle. What can you see that looks like a circle and a darker circle inside? It's the eye, isn't it? Directly relates. We don't think about it, but it directly relates. Another example. If we look at the walnut, a walnut, you find it's a hard shell when it comes. It doesn't come with an open shell when we first buy it from the supermarkets. When we first get it, it's in a shell. That shell is in reference. What do we know that the walnut's good for? The walnut's good for the brain. The nutrition's for the brain. It's in a shell. Our brain is in what? In a skull, in a shell. When you open that shell, what do you see? You see the walnut which resembles the brain, doesn't it? You find that it has a right-hand side and it has a left-hand side, and you can divide it into two. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us this, shows us these signs. And this is in all his foods. Take another example, the tomato, for example. If you dissect a tomato, not, not vertically, horizontally, you'll find it has four different sections. The tomato is known in the scientific field to be good for the heart, the blood flow. The heart, if you study the anatomy of the heart, it has four chambers. The tomato has four chambers. Furthermore, look at celery. Celery is good for the bones. What does it look like? It looks like a bone if you dissect it. 
And this is, this is one of the most amazing ones. An avocado, we don't look at it, the avocado in itself, from blossom to harvest, just over eight months, the avocado looks like the womb. Do you start to put the points together of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs on earth? You begin to see this and you begin to see the beauty of Allah's signs on earth, subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we overlook it. Kidney beans, why is it called kidney beans? They're good for the kidney and they're shaped like the kidney. Subhanallah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us this. And he tells us this is directly influencing the particular body part, but we overlook it. Now let's look at another narration. When we look at this is halal food, he puts us into an aspect, this is what you should eat. This is how you should eat it. Do not overeat. Do not eat until you're hungry. Make sure that you take salt before and after a food. It will what? It will remove 73 types of illnesses. It's to say that when you're in the daytime, when the sun is up, it's all to do with cycles. It says when the sun is up, make sure you're standing when you drink the water. When the, when the sun is down and the moon is up, make sure you're sitting down when you drink the water. It's not for any particular reason. It's for our salvation. It's to do with our cycles. It's try to help us. And that's all what halal and haram is. When Allah makes something halal, and this is what you have to understand, when Allah makes something halal, it's to benefit us. Whether we see the benefit or we don't see the benefit. At the end of the day, Allah knows the benefit, even though we cannot see it. When Allah makes something haram, it's to directly say that what? That this will affect you in a negative way, whether you see it or whether you don't see it. As a, even the people that are not Muslim, as a Christian per person, in a massive seminar that he had, he says, do you know why the Muslims do not eat the pig? And the people say, we don't know why the Muslims do not eat pig. He says, do you know what the pig actually eats? The pig, you go to any farmer, you tell them, what's a pig doing in your farm? He says, it cleans up. It's like a cleaning machine. It cleans up all the feces, anything on the ground. He says, he'll eat anything. We have them in the farm, so they clean. He says, therefore, their whole nutrition is made out of what? Waste. And he says, you're eating all of that. That's why Islam comes forth and says what? Do not eat this particular animal. Because it's harmful for you. And we can go into, into depth about how harmful the pig actually is towards the human from a scientific field. How many diseases have emerged from the eating of this particular animal? Let's look at haram food. We've looked at and dissected this is what Ahl bayt say in a gist. And we can look at it the more we want to learn with, the more we can look into it. Let's look at haram food. Let's look at foods that are questionable. When we look at haram foods, the narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when a person intakes one, remember this, one piece or one bite of haram sustenance, of haram food, he says that his prayers, his dua, his worship will not be accepted for 40 days. Someone may come forth and ask, why 40 days? If we have nijas or anything on, our, on us, can we pray? We can't pray. If we have any kind of impurity on our, our clothes, whether our skin, depending on the quantity that it has, we cannot do a particular act of worship. Obviously, we'd have to get rid of that before we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a pure state. Now, imagine if that particular substance wasn't on the outside, was on the inside. That impurity has to leave our body before we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before our worship is accepted, before our dua is accepted. So therefore, even in scientific fields, it's saying that there takes 40 days until that impurity leaves your body completely. What did the Prophet say? The Prophet says 40 days, your prayers and your duas and your worship is not accepted. Does it go hand in hand? It goes hand in hand, 100%. Now let's look at it furthermore. What effect does it have on the body? This haram nutrition, what, does, what effect does it have? Whether it be questionable or unquestionable, if it's haram. Whether you know it's haram or you don't know it's haram. It has an idea that yes, you will be punished if you know it's haram. And if you didn't know it's haram, you'll not be punished. However, it will still affect your body because that's still in your body. You can't take that out. Knowingly or unknowingly eating that haram. That's why we say stay away from anything that's questionable. Because it will have a direct effect, whether you know of it or you don't. That's why it's so important that even when Imam Sadiq is asked, 
He said, and look at, the, look at the effect that it may draw you towards, the effect that haram food can make you, even as a Muslim, as a muwali of Ahlul Bayt. Imam al-Sadiq is asked, why is it on the 10th of Muharram, you had one side of an army praying salah, jama'ah, they had an adhan, and another side of the army also had adhan, and also had jama'ah. He says, what's the difference? How is it that these majority of the Muslims fought the Imam of their time, fought the grandson of the Prophet of Islam? Look at the reply of Imam Sadiq. Look at the reply. He says, Muli'at butunahum min al haram. Now, the depth of this, we can look at it in two different angles, whether it be haram food or food purchased with haram sauce. Now, there's two different angles. However, in the end of the day, that haram is inside them. That haram will affect them directly. That's so much that they go against the imam of their time. They go against the grandson of the prophet. Yes, that is the end result of something that will be ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. And you remain in that state. Remain eating the haram. Remain in that particular concept that you, or circle that you put yourself in. That's the direct effect and that's the major effect that you go against the Ahlul Bayt. You go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does have a direct effect on your soul. When we find, and this is what we mentioned yesterday, when the daughter, and this is, this is why we have to teach our children, this is why we have to teach ourselves before we teach our children, that stay away from anything that's questionable. We said yesterday that the daughter, the six-year-old daughter of Abu Asud al-Du'ali, when she got the honey, do you remember yesterday? When she got the honey from Muawiyah, and she ate it, as soon as she knew it was from Muawiyah, what did she do? She put her hand, she regurgitated, made sure there's nothing left in her system. Everything that may come from Muawiyah, she vomited it out or regurgitated it out. And then she tells him, It's very important to look at. And that's why even yesterday when we did mention this, the ideology of istighfar, Ali ibn Abi Talib, in the fourth point, what does he say? After he says that the istighfar number one, what did we say? Istighfar number one is that you regret the sin. Number two is that you will not repeat it. Number three, you finish the worship between you and Allah, get it up to date. Number four, we say that between you and the people, make sure everything is balanced and clear. Number five, and what it refers to tonight, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, make sure any fats and meat that were what? That were built, based or fertile by what? By the haram sources, make sure you burn that off. That's what it's referred to tonight, inshallah. That food that's questionable, that may affect you in a negative manner. Make sure that's not in your body, not in your system anymore. Therefore, you can be you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month. Anyway, that's questionable, make sure you make sure about the sources that it has before you eat it because it will affect you. It will directly affect you. Insha'Allah. And this is what I want to highlight, and this is the important point for this lecture tonight, is that we understand the effects that haram food may have. And it's so much more, even, like, for example, even the drinks such as alcohol. There's many things that have alcohol in them that we, we find nowadays, if you look up on the internet, that we do not even think about. Nowadays, it has a small percentage. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does he say? He says alcohol, if you want to look at insignificance. He says alcohol. He says to Ali ibn Abi Talib, in a wasiyah, he says, Oh Ali, know that if all the sins were put in one house, the key of that house would be alcohol. He says that's the significance of such a drink. The key of that. And we find that 100% when we look at the people that fought Ahlul Bayt. When we look at Muawiyah and Ali ibn Abi Talib. When we look at Imam Hussein when he fought Yazid. What was being drunk? How was food being eaten in the court of Yazid? What did Abu Huraira when we look at him, as they look at him as a great companion? We find Abu Huraira on the battle of Safin. Where was he? Did he take sides? Was he with Ali ibn Abi Talib? People looked at him. He's the narrator of hadith to them. Was he with in Safin? Was he with Muawiyah? Was he with Ali ibn Abi Talib? What did they find Abu Huraira? He's on a till of sand. What does he say? He says, As salat waraha Ali afdal wal ta'am wal akil ma'a Muawiyah 
I left, isn't it? And says, well, وَقُوفَ عَلَى تَلِّ أَسْلَمْ He says, what? He says, the prayers, look at the idea that he had. He says, the prayers behind Ali ibn Abi Talib is much more rewarding. What does he refer to Muawiyah as? He says, the food with Muawiyah is more tasty. What does that tell us, brothers and sisters? That tells us who the Ahl al-Bayt were. And it tells us who the opposition of Ahl al-Bayt were. And in, especially in this topic for tonight, the idea of how they ate, what they ate, and how it affected them to make them either go towards the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or go against it. And it's a very important topic that needs depth, brothers and sisters. A very important topic that we cannot overlook. Now the third and final point, inshallah, when I conclude tonight, and it's very brief that I'm going over these particular points. The third and final point, and it's very important for the topic for tonight and for Ramadan, is the nutrition for our bodies that we do not look at. And that's a spiritual nutrition. The spiritual food that our body needs. Because on one aspect, it's a physical food that nourishes our soul, nourishes our stomach, our physical beings. But the food that will spiritually nourish us is the one that's important. Is the one for our salvation. The spiritual food, what do I mean? When you go in this month and when you close your stomach towards these foods, when you close your stomachs, the imams, what do they say? They say, make sure that for this month, you fast knowing that Allah made it obligatory on us so that the rich of us know what it feels like that the poor are feeling or how the poor are suffering, how the poor try to find food every day. Try to feel what they feel. Humble yourself. And then it says what? After you do that and you're in that state, make sure you nourish your soul. Make sure you nourish yourself. How? It says... And this is all taken into account when we look at the foods and how it affects our body. That's one angle. But what? Try to explain this. When we have a hadith that say when you read Quran, it strengthens your memory. It makes your eyesight stronger. How can you explain that to a normal person? You can't, but it's belief. It's something to do with your soul. When you begin to feed your soul with what? Rather than feed it with haram vision. Feed it with the Quran. Feed your soul with the vision of beauty. Feed your soul with, if you are blessed, inshallah, to go towards Yara, feed your vision with the vision of the Ziyara, with the vision of the shrine, with the vision of everything in and around these sacred places. This is what you should be feeding yourself. It's not a physical food, rather what? It's a spiritual food. When you listen to, for example, Quran, when you listen to, wherever it may be towards Ahl bayt poetry, whether it be Latmiyat, Mawalid, that's what? That's instilling in your soul. It becomes part and parcel of you. When you listen to music, and that's why it becomes haram. When you listen to music, why? It nourishes your soul. That's why of one of the aspects it becomes haram. It nourishes your soul. You begin to what? The more you listen to it, the more you become inclined towards it. That's why when you listen to Quran, you become more inclined to, uh, towards it. When you read, the more you read, you become inclined towards it. Because what? You're feeding yourself. It's all food, and the more you take, the more you want this spiritual food. And this is the important one. This is the one, inshallah, we can come into Ramadan and say, this is the one that we want to feed ourselves. This is how we want to nourish ourselves during this holy month of Ramadan. And because it's the best opportunity. We have gatherings like we have in this particular Husayniyyah, where we find the Qur'an is being read, and a khatma every night is being read. Why? Nourishes ourselves. People come. After they have their foods, after they gather with their families, they come towards the Husseiniyat. They can read at home. Why? Because they say we're in gatherings. We crave for that company. We crave for recitation of the Holy Quran. We crave to be in such gatherings. Why? Because it nourishes us on a physical level? No, on a spiritual level. We crave these gatherings. When, when we're in gatherings, when we remember the Ahlul Bayt, the time flies. Even I talk in a personal perspective, when we remember them, even in universities, when we have closed gatherings, when we talk about Ahl al-Bayt, the time flies and you think to yourself, wow, it's our time for the next class and you had a three-hour gap. Because there's barakah in it, your heart craves towards it. People around us, not even Muslim, they crave when they listen towards Ali ibn Abi Talib and the merit of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They crave it. Your soul is inclined towards it. It's fatra. As the Hajj mentioned, he says, there's something inside you that inclines you towards someone. That's why even in aspect, inshallah, I conclude with this. 
if you think about it, there's some people that you look at, you've never met in your life. You look at, you're drawn towards them. You are drawn towards them. Everyone can relate to this. Other people you see for the first time, you don't know who they are. You've never met them in their life, but something draws you away. Ali ibn Talib says about this. He says, before, before your time, you were made in armies. Whoever is knowing to one another used to be knowing to one another. However, anyone that you disassociate yourself with, you weren't friends back then. And he refers to Alam al-Rawah, he refers to Alam al-Dhar. It's a very explicit concept. However, what? The important aspect for tonight, inshallah, we want to take home, is the effect that the food has on us. When the Imams tell us that it's to remember the poor, it's not to have lavishing foods and lavishing surroundings and just feed ourselves, it's to remember the poor. Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the last night he was hit, what happened? When his daughter gave him food, did she give him a luscious food? Or did she give him three little pieces? And Ali ibn Abi Talib says, what? Look at the beautiful narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, do you want me to stand longer on the day of judgment? He had bread, salt, and a cup of milk. He says, do you want me to stay long on the day of judgment? Ali ibn Abi Talib. We end on this note, brothers and sisters, inshallah. We take from tonight, and we can learn to think about our food, think about how we intake food, think about the poor, inshallah. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he rids away from us anything that is haram. And he makes us firm on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.